the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Let's say you own a horse. And you want to take that horse and you want to turn it into a racehorse. You want him to run. You want him to compete. You want him to finish the race. You want him to finish in the top. But this horse that you have, it's not particularly interested in running or going fast or maybe even finishing the race at all. So the likelihood that you can turn this, race, this horse into a racehorse becomes slim. He doesn't really want to run or compete. How do you train him? How do you train this horse who likes to walk slowly and has no desire to run, to run? to compete and to finish. You could dangle a carrot in front of him and hope that a reward might motivate him. Or you could use a stick and hope that he could be motivated to avoid punishment and fear. Or you could try something else, maybe a little bit of reserve, reverse psychology. This horse, as we said, doesn't want to run, but he'll walk slowly, he'll trot around, he'll just amble through life. So you decide, I'm going to try something different. Every time he takes a leisurely step, you say, whoa, too fast, slow down. The next time, he puts out his leg, his hoof hits the ground, not yet, whoa, slow down. Where are you going? Why the rush? And he starts to get a little antsy. He just wants to walk. All he wants to do is walk. So he tries again, he takes another little step, and you let him take one step, and then he takes a second step, and you're like, whoa, slow down. Where are you off to? And before you know it, all this energy from the horse that just wanted to walk turns into this burst of energy that comes out and begins running because he's had all this pent-up walking that he wasn't allowed to do. I don't know about you, this might not make sense, but for me, that's where I'm at right now in terms of preparing for Lent. I've been talking about it for the last three or four weeks. I keep thinking like, okay, it's ready to start. We're here. I had to stop myself last Monday from buying a pound of lentils. We could still eat meat this last week. But every time I walked into the store, I was like, oh, I gotta prepare for Lent. I gotta make sure that my like, grocery list is, is ready for the fast. And I've been spending so much time preparing and speaking about it and preaching about it that I'm just ready. I'm just ready to take off. I'm just ready to start. And that's what the church is doing by giving us these weeks, as I've mentioned, helping us to get ready to get ready, preparing us for Lent so that we can start off with a burst of energy and actually compete and finish and complete the race that is this Lenten season. And so I said, the last couple weeks, the church has been giving us things, themes they've been putting in front of us, not just to introduce the Lenten theme to us, but also to act as a roadblock. Not yet. Before you start, remember this next thing. Before you start, remember to be humble. Before you start, remember that the path is repentance. Before you start, remember to minister to other people. And so we're at this last point preparatory week, this last week before the fast officially begins. And so today the church puts that one last roadblock in front of us to remind us of what we're supposed to do before they open the gates and they let us run out into the fast and sprint towards Christ. This race that we're running began, as the church showed us, with humility and last week we heard about how humility leads to repentance through the return of the prodigal son. And finally today we hear about how repentance is manifest as action, as the Son of Man separates the sheep from the goats. These are the things the church puts in front of us to remind us, this is what you're going to be doing. This is what you're going to be doing. In humility you will return to God and you will return to your fellow man and show mercy. Each of these three builds on one another. As I said last week, we heard what God's will was. He said, his will is that we should turn back and live. And that turning back 
is the act of repentance. And we described going to holy confession as that turning towards God and closing the chasm between us. But the point is, if this is God's will for us today, what does that life look like when he says that he wants us to turn back and live? That's what Christ describes for us today as he separates the sheep, those who do the will of his father, from the goats, those who do not. Those who live, as he says, versus those who reject the way of life that he provides. So let's start with the goats and see what is this life? What is this last lesson that the church wants us to receive before beginning our race? After being put on the left side, the goats, those who don't follow the will of Christ, cry out and they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? They've forgotten what Christ foretold earlier in his ministry in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, quote, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into my kingdom but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The goats cry out. They say, Lord, when did we do this? When did we miss it? Lord. As if simply saying his name is enough. As if simply acknowledging that Jesus is God, that having this belief in our head is enough. Lord, when did we not do this? He says, you didn't do the will of my father. These goats might claim to know Christ. They even confess him as their Lord, but they don't love him. Because again, earlier in his ministry, Christ foretold and he said, quote, at that day you will know that I am in the father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and he who keeps my commandments, it is he who loves me. Keeping Christ's commandments, doing the will of the Father, as he says, and loving him are one and the same thing. We cannot love him if we will not follow his commandments. Time and time again throughout the scriptures, you will see Christ says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's not enough to say something with our mouths. We must do it with our actions. It is not enough to confess him as Lord and cry out in front of him. We must also follow and do the will of his Father. We must love him and keep his commandments. And why should we keep his commandments? Why should we love him? As St. John says in his epistle, we love because he first loved us. Although we were distant from him, once we turned and took a step towards him in repentance, he ran towards us in mercy. We've received his love. We've received his mercy. Think back, as I said, that each of these weeks build on each other. Think back to the publican and the Pharisee. The publican, the sinful man who asks for God's mercy, and Christ says, this man who was sinful, in his humility, he is the one that went back justified. Think last week about the prodigal son, who spent his life in his father's earnings in sinful ways and completely rejected his father and his family, and spent everything he had until his life was nothing and he was living with pigs. And he took one step back and his father ran to him. We have received his mercy. We are the beneficiaries of God's love. Therefore, Christ tells us, be merciful as our Father is merciful. If we desire his mercy for ourselves, if we enter into Lent seeking forgiveness from God, if we wish to be loved but are unwilling to extend that same love, that same mercy and that forgiveness to others, then we're in fact unworthy of what we ask. God loves us and shows us his mercy. He runs to us and heals us. If we love him, then shouldn't we try to be like him? 
be merciful as he is merciful. It is the mark of our love for God to imitate him and therefore to run and show compassion on others. Thus, the words of St. Paul actually come to fruition when he said in his epistle to the Romans, through the mercy shown to you, they may also obtain mercy. The sheep, those sitting at the right hand, are none other than those who love God. And by loving God, they have shown their love of neighbor. They know what it is to be forgiven for their sins and their mistakes. They know what it is to receive mercy, and therefore, they offer it. This is the journey of Lent. The last few weeks, we've described it in its entirety. The journey of Lent is in humility to understand our own self and the gap and the chasm that exists between God's perfection and our sin. And to turn, to run to him and allow him to run to us, to close that gap and having received his mercy to offer it to others. It is not enough for us to receive forgiveness. We must also offer it. It is not enough for us to be fed by the church. We must feed others. It is not enough, enough for us to find love and warmth in a community of brothers and sisters for ourselves. We must become brothers and sisters offering it to each other even to the stranger and the enemy. So, this is what lies ahead of us. This is the path that God has mapped out, and this is the race that we are to run over the next couple of weeks. Are you ready? Amen. Amen.